There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. For instance, number one, you can never have sex. Hi, my name's Dave Adams. And I'm Ricky Sherwood. And you're watching The Core Mechanic. Today we're looking at number 23 on Mike's list, Betrayal at House on the Hill. Betrayal at House on the Hill was designed by all-star cast Rob Davio, Bruce Glasgow, Bill McQuillan, Mike Selinker, and Tierwin Woodruff, and published by Avalon Hill in 2004. The game plays between three and six people, with a playtime of between 30 minutes and two hours. Betrayal at House on the Hill won the 2004 Gamer's Choice Award for Best Board Game. So, Dave, what exactly would you say the core mechanic of this game is? Um, I mean, well, let's there's... face it, you have no goal. Nope. You don't know, you know there's a trader, but you don't know who the trader is. You don't even know what the, end, the win condition is from the get-go. Nope. Um, look, I, I guess in some parts, he puts, this is a toll lane game according to Mike. Yeah, it's um, what you do, certainly. It's one of the lane things tiles, that you do. Yeah. Traditionally, toll lane games have an element where you lay the tile to do something. Pseudo. So you're laying the, the, the tile to progress or to... Uh, score victory points or to gather resources, whereas this is really just about exploration. Exactly, and there's never been anything quite like it, as far as I know. Yeah, I think it does that whole uh, that whole uh, fog of war sort of thing. Well, yes. I mean, it's I'm not sure if that's the best term for it. I like it, but the the idea that you're going through a house and until you've walked into a room, you don't know what's in there and you don't know what's going to be there. All you know is that there could be a door down there that you could go and explore. Yeah, and so, when you stop, something will happen. And it brings in that whole element then, like in terms of uh, the theme of the story. I mean, I think. As much as Mike called it tile lane, I really want to impress storytelling as a major part of this this whole game experience. Yeah, this is definitely the sort of thing that what happens with the players, the atmosphere that's been created by this horror setting, you are telling a story, even if it's not specifically written on cards. Well, that's right. And the, I think... That one of the, I think you've even mentioned it before, that the only two things you really know about the game is that you're trapped in a horror story, mm -hmm. and uh, how many players are playing. And somewhere that along the line, a house. Yep, somewhere along the line, someone is going to betray everyone else. That's right. So or not. Or not. <laughs> well, I played a scenario where no one's the traitor. Oh, you see, and that just... Spoilers. That does, the, <laughs> that does my head in. Because the, for me, part of the, the whole tension of it is this build-up. Like, you're going through, you're exploring rooms, you're finding objects, Things are occurring, and I, I, one of the things I like is that it's not even a directly combative element of the game where you have to take on an enemy at the end, yeah. but you need uh, your, your stamina, your strength, your, your health, well, and your knowledge, your, your knowledge, and, your knowledge and, your and sanity. sanity yes. So, so it's, it's strength or it's not, it's health is all of them. Yeah, it's speed, strength, speed, strength, sanity, sanity and knowledge. knowledge. Yeah. And the fact is, is that you spend most of the game losing that as you lead up to the end. <laughs> The end climax. Number two, you can never drink or do drugs. <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's brilliant, but the whole time I'm exploring the house, every time someone gets an item, or every time I don't get an item, I'm sitting there going, oh, please, please don't, don't betray please, us. <laughs> you know? Please don't be the traitor, and I don't want to be the traitor. Oh. Well, yeah, I almost, I almost feel like if anyone's going to be the traitor, I'd rather it be me. Simply because, you know... You get an advantage of some description. But, ah, uh, it's just, you, you ne because you don't yep. know, that there's no way to plan for it still. Yep. So even though you know it's happening, you can't come up with a plan. Yep. And this is what makes the game really interesting in terms of game mechanics. This goes in the face of everything we've rarely explored about having clear set goals, about having determined strategies. I mean, there's a lot of known elements, but it's nothing that you can really do. It raises the question, how does one get better at Betrayal at House on the Hill? I think you, in some senses you become more aware of what to expect. Yep. Um, and, and I think in, in some sometimes you, you sort of get more aware of, well, you're still safer together as a group. Yeah. Um, one of the big downsides of any horror story is if you all split up, you're yeah. doomed. And number three, 
never, ever, ever, under any circumstances, say, I'll be right back. Because you won't be back. I'm getting another beer. You want one? Yeah, sure. I'll be right back. <laughs> That's pretty much the same in this game. And there are mechanics in place for smoothing your path through. If one player picks up a particularly powerful item that can be dropped that would work better in the hands of another player and they're willing to take that gamble that that player is not going to be the traitor or even after the traitor is revealed, they can drop it. Let the other player strengthen themselves that way. It rarely does focus on that aspect of cooperation, though in a lot of our games I think that kind of gets lost. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, like for me, it is being caught in the story. Yeah. Uh, it's that sense of unknown. It's that you really feel like that tension of the, the horror film of it all building up and leading to something. And throughout the game, the game does well to introduce elements of horror as you go. So yeah. every room you go in, you might have an encounter with a ghost. Uh, or in, ca in my case, nearly every time I play the game, I encounter that f that that ghost that is on fire running through the hallway. <laughs> and I always roll terribly for it. It always hits me and does a lot of damage. It's horrid. To be fair, the game is set up that way. I mean, dice that roll absolutely nothing. Oh. Yep. But once again, Easily. another mechanic that adds on to the tension that the game builds. Every time someone picks up an omen card and has to roll those dice, your well, heart is in your throat by about turn three or four. Now tell me though, I mean, in terms of that, there people are really quick to, if if they're quick to criticise it, they're quick to criticise those elements that the game is unbalanced and it leads to bad stories. Yeah. And if they're quick to defend it, they're usually quick to say things like, I know it can lead to bad stories and I know it can have uh, poor mechanics, but uh, I still enjoy it. Is I don't even know if that's fair. Like, for me, I just enjoy it. Yeah. I, I'm not, maybe I've been fortunate enough not to have a bad story. But, you know, I know that the game can move really quickly, that if even after three turns or three omen cards, you could roll zero. I've rolled zilch on the dice. I think Five dice, no pips. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think this ties back into this idea that the end goal, who the traitor is going to be and what scenario it's going to be, is completely unknown to you. Since you can't do much more than explore the house and hopefully get ready for that, you might as well enjoy the journey. And in this way, the game is more about exploration than finishing it. Yeah, I think you're shortchanging yourself, though, as well, if you don't actually take the time to read all the text. Like, we... Oh, yeah. When, especially when we've played it the last few times, um, we've paid particular attention to the flavour text, to... Like, we even read all the cards read and silly, spooky out. voices. Yep. Every card gets read out loud. It's never just... Oh, it's the dagger, put it under. It's, we read everything. Yeah. And in some sense, we want to put ourselves into the story. So even when we go away and we separate out, we read the whole scenario. We don't just find out what we have to do to win the game. It's not about winning. It's about seeing how the story unfolds. You are me. in a haunted house and spooky things are happening. If you're not helping those spooky things to happen, you're shortchanging the game. Definitely. Yeah. I think if you're not in, at least taking time to enjoy even even some of the more hammy parts of yeah. it, like the, you know, just the some of the more silly elements of it, which are totally yeah. horror-based story. Like, so many horror stories are hammy and terrible, and I love them for that as well. Mine now, doll. And if you know what's good for you, you are going to love, honor, and obey. I wouldn't marry you if you had the body of G.I. Joe. Hey, Raggedy Ann, you looked in the mirror lately? Now's not the time to get picky. <laughs> Look, if you can't enjoy losing two sanity because a spider landed on your face, you're playing the wrong game. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so many silly things like that. I yeah, love them, though. It's, it's so good. I, I don't think it's any coincidence that this um, is co-designed by two of the best, I suppose, or two of the greatest storytellers in board games. Yes. I mean, it, it's like Mike Selenker, who is all about, you know, the storytelling. Uh, from Pathfinder, uh, the actual RPG, like mm. having lots to do with D&D uh, &D and Pathfinder, and then creating a Pathfinder adventure card game, taking those story elements, putting them into cards, um, through to all of his games, built, like building into this, 
this whole concept of the experience of the game and the story of the game and us as players being part of telling and contributing and building that story. And then there's Rob Davio who created Pandemic Legacy, trying to create a board game that changes constantly. And I think that there's got to, this has got to have been, this has got to have influenced. Oh, yeah. Definitely. The thing is, every time you enter this house, it is going to be a completely new experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think the the whole idea of it's it's almost an exploration or an attempt to create a game that will be completely different every time, even if you get the same, same story scenario twice. scenario at the end of the thing, yeah. If it turns out to be the same scenario, there's no way in which the setup and lead-in will be exactly the same. Your house will be different, the items you have will be different, your stats will be different, and even the players you're playing with are probably going to be different. Yeah, I find even knowledge of scenarios doesn't help with building the rooms. Like, you know, oh, okay... If I build the, build the rooms really close, or I've got this room, or I'm going to put it close to here because we'll need to run from here to here if mm. it's that scenario, could totally throw you in a different scenario. Enjoy your 1 in 50 chance of that's, getting that same scenario. That's again. right. 1 in 50 chance. And I, like, I'm even more excited. Like I haven't had a chance to play Widow's Walk yet, but one of the things that I think Mike does brilliantly, and it's pretty much a testimony here as much as it is any other game that he's been involved with designing is that he is a guy that builds collaboration. He's all about the collaboration. Everything he does is about pulling together great storytellers, great uh, writers, great game designers, and just seeing what uh, people with great ideas can do together. And I think this game is a good example of that. Which is probably exactly why Betrayal at House on the Hill is as unique as it is and earned its spot on the list. In terms of game design, what exactly would you yourself take away and look at trying to adapt or apply to your own games? Well, the interesting thing about that is, as I mentioned before, it's so unlike what a game is supposed to be. You know, the resources leading to the goal sort of aspect of it. This really encourages me to focus more on how players talk with each other and how That's they experience the game. It'd be interesting to see if you could create a game without end. Yeah, isn't that called D and D? No, it's called Monopoly. <laughs> hey, hey, booyah! Anyway, <laughs> no, but certainly challenging those preconceptions that we have in games. That's how you yeah. start to innovate. Yeah, I think I think that's good. Like asking those big questions, seeing what where where they could lead to in, in finding their answers. I mean, for me, just the it just shows like just thinking through that whole starting a game with not knowing what the end win condition will be. You know, like, having the, the amount of time and planning that went into this game to come up with all the different scenarios that if you're in this room with this item, then you get this story and this is the person who's the betrayer. Yeah. Like, all those things, how much time did they take playtesting this? How hard was it to put those things together? And yet, what's the payoff? The payoff is that you genuinely have an unknown element of the game. Like, I start the game... I explore the game, all I can do is explore because I don't even know how to finish it yet. Yeah. I don't and, know what's going to happen. And you may as well have fun doing it as well. Absolutely. I've lost games of Betrayal at House on the Hill, but at that stage, you've got it or you don't, or you've got oh, some way to work it out. I've pretty much, most, pretty much only lost games. I think I've only won one game. Yeah. Uh, most of the times it's I'm the bad guy, yep. I'm the betrayer, and I can't roll for crap. <laughs> Not for the life of me. I remember I was the, the hide, some Hydra snake and I had to leave uh, bits ah, of me yes. as I go through the room. I couldn't move out of rooms for the life of me. I think I got through three rooms and every time I went into battle with someone, they would absolutely destroy me. I just could not roll. The game was over very quick. But that's part of it. Like, we were laughing. Yep. Bar like, big belly laughs the whole time. It was yep. good fun. It was quality gameplay. And that's the important thing about it, is fun. Yeah. It's just... But th and that, that's what they do. That, that's what he does, though. Like, Mike and, and, and Rob and the, these other creators, they come together, they think about this as an experience. Yeah. It's not just a game, it's an experience. And you have a part of that. I, I think I value the most the way they value us as players in the game. Yeah. It's not, here are some mechanics, do the mechanics, you'll have some fun. It's, you have a role to play in this game. Yep. Bring yourself to it, 
and you'll have even more fun. And in a way, it's a bit of a risk because that shows that as designers, they trust the players. That's a good point, actually. There are some players I just wouldn't trust. And that's probably why you do get people who have really bad experiences with the yeah. trail that has on the hill. And not, and not to blame those people specifically, like to say, oh, it's your fault if you don't have fun. I mean, I maybe there are times where it just doesn't lead to fun. Yeah. I mean, because the same could be said for any game then. Like, if you're in a bad group, you, you're not going to enjoy a game. Yeah. Um, but I think, like, it's a bigger risk to really put the pressure on the players to bring some of themselves to the gameplay experience. Yeah. Well, today, thank you for joining us as we explore the mechanics of Betrayal of House on the Hill. My name is Dave Adams. And I'm Ricky Sherwood. And you've been watching The Core Mechanic. <laughs> <laughs>